Please open your Bibles to the first letter of John, chapter 2. Today, we will be looking at just two verses, but in these two verses, we're going to continue to see that the believer is one that has a new relationship to sin, and we're also going to see the provision of God for us when we do sin. Now, this is no small encouragement and comfort to us, but it's truth that should bring us great joy in our walk with Christ. John writes in verses 1 and 2 of 1 John chapter 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we've covered a lot of ground in the last couple of weeks, making our way through the first chapter of 1 John in which John has established himself as an authoritative eyewitness of the incarnation, one who heard, saw, and touched Jesus Christ in the flesh. John witnessed his miracles, listened to his teaching, saw his transfiguration, was present at his crucifixion, and after the resurrection, he saw the resurrected Christ. The Apostle John was among those Christ chose to be his followers and commissioned as his authorized apostles and representatives. And when we build our faith on the apostolic message and testimony of Jesus Christ, we are building on a firm foundation. Next, the Apostle John proceeded to declare in verse 5, the message that they heard from him. And he proclaimed a truth about God's character and nature that he then applied to life, showing how it affects our lives. That message is this, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. God is pure, radiant light. He is truth and he is holiness. And this has direct repercussions for those who claim to know him and how they live. John made negative claims, which many believe was a direct confrontation and assault on the false teachers and their false teaching in verses 6, 8, and 10 of chapter 1. He writes, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now these truths flow directly from the message that God is light. Because if you have fellowship with the God who is light, truth, and holiness, then you not only come to know who he is, what he is like, and what pleases him, but you also come to know who you are in light of who God is. And that will reveal things about yourself, such as sin and corruption, and your motives and character and conduct. So to claim to have fellowship with the God who is light and truth while walking in darkness, or to say that you don't have sin, is to show that you are lying, that you don't know him, and that his truth is not in you. Because if you can live an unchanged life in sin, or if you can look inside and not see sin, then the light of God's truth is not on in you. But also, in light of the message that God is light, John has also told us other things in chapter 1 that are very encouraging. He wrote in verses 7 and 9 that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Christian life is not a life of either indulging in sin or denying sin. If we truly know the God who is truth and holiness, we must walk in his truth and pursue holiness. Of course, we won't be able to do that without seeing our sin and our corruption, but we're told that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So as we come to know God in Christ, we're forgiven of our sins and given new desires to live a new life. 
As we follow God in Christ, we also realize that we're not yet sinlessly perfect and still stumble and fall. But because of our new heart that desires to please him, we grieve over our sins and we confess them. And as we do that, we continue to experience his forgiveness and his cleansing. This is so very encouraging. Now, we come to our text in the first two verses of chapter 2, which help us to further see how the believer has a new relationship to sin and to see how Jesus Christ is defending us today in heaven. So let's look at what John writes. First, John addresses his readers as my little children. And this is a beautiful expression. He writes to them as his little children, not in any way suggesting that they were immature or that they were very, very young. John is the last living apostle and a very aged man. And so he can call most people children, but he is using this as an expression of his affection for them as their spiritual father in the faith who had likely won many of them to Christ. He had great affection for them as his spiritual children. And so John writes with fatherly compassion and pastoral concern for the spiritual well-being of these believers. And that is an important thing to keep in mind as we read the first letter of John. It's coming from an older man who writes with fatherly compassion and deep pastoral concern from one who has no greater joy than to see that his children are walking in the truth, one who is for us and wants to see us do well, and one who is ahead of us and can show us the way to live well in Christ. Next, John tells his readers the purpose of his writing. And that purpose is that believers may not sin. Look at this. He writes, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. What he has in mind here is not that believers may not have habitual lifestyles of sinning, since he's already ruled that out in chapter 1, verse 6, when he wrote, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. For John, there's no such thing as being a Christian and having a lifestyle characterized by habitual sinning and walking in darkness. So what he means here is not a lifestyle of sin. What he means here is instances and acts of sin. Now maybe you're thinking, I thought he just said in chapter 1, verses 8 and 10, that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Or if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John has not forgotten what he has just written. But he's telling us something that is very important by way of clarification. You see, John has made it very clear that for those who believe in Christ and walk in God's light, that there is cleansing from sin by the blood of Jesus. He's also made it very clear that those who profess to be sinless and perfect are self-deceived, are calling God a liar in his word. The truth is not in them. So, believers have forgiveness through the blood of Christ, and no one is sinless and perfect. So now, When you look at these things together, you could easily imagine someone coming to the conclusion that since no one is sinlessly perfect, and since no one can live a life without sin, then there's no point of really trying to live a life without sin. And if believers who walk in the light and confess their sins have fellowship with God and forgiveness and cleansing through the blood of Jesus, then it's not really that big of a deal if we do sin. It's not hard to imagine how adopting such a position could lead to becoming lax and lazy in our pursuit of holiness. This matters. As D.A. Carson explains, he writes, People do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward superstition and call it faith. We cherish 
the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. These are strong words, but we need to be reminded that a Christian is one who has a new relationship to sin. And what John is doing is clarifying what this means for us. He's not denying the things that he has just written. He's clarifying that what he has just said does not mean that because no one can be sinless, they shouldn't try to live without sin. And he also doesn't want anyone to come to the false conclusion that because Christians are those cleansed by the blood of Christ, that sin is somehow no big deal for the Christian. John is writing these things so that we may not sin. We're not to use forgiveness as a license to sin. Sin is that which opposes God's character and nature. Sin defies and violates his law, his perfect and holy law, which reveals his just and righteous nature. Sin goes against who God is. God is good and sin is evil. God is righteous and sin is unrighteousness. And so Christians who are followers of the God who is light should grow in despising sin and to grow in fighting against it. Saying that no one can live a sinless life doesn't contradict anything that John has written. Saying that we have forgiveness through the blood of Christ doesn't take away from our needed resolve to seek to live a life pleasing to God who has saved us. So John is making an important clarifying point. The fact that no one is without sin in this life and the fact that Christians are cleansed by the blood of Christ should not lead to a careless indifference about sin. We should be radical in our pursuit of holiness and pleasing God. Because if that's not our desire, then it won't be our pursuit. And John wants it to be both our desire and our pursuit. Now, while John wants believers to be seriously engaged in the pursuit of holiness, he also doesn't want us to despair. He doesn't want us to take sin lightly, but when we take sin seriously and we seek to live without it, he also doesn't want us to lose hope and be defeated in our guilt when we continue to stumble and fall. And so John balances this out by telling us the provision of God for our sin. He writes, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. John knows that no one is sinless or perfect. Our new life in Christ gives us forgiveness from sin and new desires to please God as well as a new power for living a new life. That doesn't mean we cannot stumble and fail. The tense he uses here is very important. If anyone does sin, he's referring again to an act of sin, to an instance of failing, a moment of weakness and giving into temptation. So when he says, if anyone does sin, he's not talking about a habitual practice that characterizes you, but to an instance of stumbling that goes against a new life that does characterize you. Having been forgiven of sin, the Christian has new desires by the Spirit of God to pursue righteousness and a growing in holiness. But in the remaining indwelling corruptions and weakness of the flesh, the believer can and does stumble into sin, but it doesn't characterize them. And so John wants us to know that as this happens, we have an advocate in heaven with the Father. And before we move on to the very important truths that remain in our text, look at the lines John has just drawn for us. John has told us that those whose lifestyle is no different than the unbeliever, those who claim to know God while walking in darkness, lie and do not practice the truth. Back in chapter 1 and verse 6. Because their lifestyle is a demonstration of what they truly desire. Also, John has shown us that those who claim to be so spiritual that they have no sin in them are self-deceived. 
Because to know God and to walk in his light will result in seeing ourselves in light of God's radiant holiness and that will reveal corruption, which in turn leads to confession in the believer. John painted these two lines for us, not to restrict us, but to make the way clear. That freedom is neither in living in sin nor in denying sin. Freedom is found in knowing God and living a life to please Him. To walk in the light, to keep His commandments, to not commit wrongdoing, to not be indifferent to what God thinks, but to care deeply about what God thinks and to seek to honor and to please Him. And that is freedom. I can think of no better example of that than just to think of heaven itself. We think of heaven as a perfect place of happiness and joy, and it is, but it is a place where there is no sin in those who live there. The way of perfect joy and happiness is the way of being without sin. And so we need to see that the pursuit of living free from sin is the pursuit of freedom in walking in God's light in Christ. If it's your desire and pursuit to please God, then even though you are painfully aware of your imperfections and failures, you can be assured that you know God. And in your remaining corruptions and in your remaining failures, you need to know you have an advocate. One who stands in your defense so that you don't despair, but can have great confidence before God. Look at this next beautiful truth that he declares. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word advocate here comes from a Greek word often transliterated in English as paraclete. It means comforter or helper. It's a word that is used of the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel. And it is a word that is used of Jesus here in 1 John. How is Jesus our advocate? Well, what John is painting here is like a courtroom scene. God the Father is the judge. The sinning believer is like one on trial. Jesus is the advocate in their defense. And though he's not mentioned here, we can add someone else into this scene. Satan, who in Revelation 12.10 is called the accuser of the brethren. Now, when we sin as believers, Our sins against God are not small. And they require judgment. Satan uses the law to accuse us before God. Look at what they've done. Are you just going to let them get away with that? You are holy and you are just and you can't let sin go unpunished. Jesus is our advocate. He is our legal defense in this scene. But he doesn't argue our innocence. Before the Father, when Satan, the law, and even our own consciences accuse us, Jesus is not there to argue our innocence and say, oh, you know, they didn't really do that or they didn't really mean that or under those circumstances, this was all that they could really do and so on and so forth. That's not the kind of advocate that Jesus is. He's not like a lawyer in an earthly court who seeks to plead the innocence of his client. He's not there to make us look innocent when we sin. Before looking at how Jesus is our advocate, I want you to realize that when we sin, even as believers, we don't even understand the full extent of how bad we have been or how greatly our sin offends a holy God. God feels wrath and indignation against 
Sin, because it is the very contradiction of his holy character and righteous nature. It is in the nature of God to hate sin and his wrath burns against it. He is perfectly just. He is perfectly righteous in all of his judgment. The world excuses sin. For instance, the world will tell lies and say, oh, it's only a little white lie. It doesn't really hurt anyone. But God is truth. And so even if a lie doesn't seem to hurt anyone, it goes against the nature and character of God who is truth. When we engage in impure thoughts and words and actions, we are going against the very nature of the one who is radiant in his purity and perfect in his faithfulness. And so sin is more evil than we could ever see or understand with our imperfect hearts and minds. But before the perfect God of the universe, sin is an exceedingly great offense. If nothing else, we can see that's true in three things. First, we can see that sin is a great evil when we consider how the fall of the entire human race was the result of a single act of sin against God. That in turn opened the floodgates to all other human sins. Second, we can see that sin is evil when we consider God's eternal punishment against sin. Hell exists because God made it as the place for the devil and his angels who rebelled against him. And hell is also the place where people who die in their sins apart from Jesus Christ will go when they die. Thirdly, we can see that sin is evil when we consider God's remedy against sin that it was the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, his beloved son, who bore the wrath and curse of God for our sins on the cross, that that is what it took, the death of the most valuable and glorious person in the universe to make things right between us and God. These things help us see That sin is no small matter. So it's not that sins of unbelievers, those are a big deal, but God doesn't really care so much about the sins of the believers because, you know, they're just in. All sin is exceedingly offensive to a holy God. And so as Christians, we need to know something about the provision that God has made for us today in heaven as believers when we do sin because as we grow nearer to God, we grow more mindful of his holiness, more aware of what pleases him and also more aware of how we fail to please him and how we sin and how exceedingly evil that is. We need to grow in our awareness of the greatness of Christ and the work he has done so that we continue to have great joy even in the face of continuing to fail. Sin is an exceedingly great evil that God cannot overlook. In defending us before the Father, our advocate doesn't argue for our innocence or explain why we should be let off because of anything good in us. What then does he plead? Well, to answer that, let's look at how he's described. Our advocate is called Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, the name Jesus is a reference to his humanity. And the title Christ is a reference to his deity. He is the God man. He is the most valuable and glorious being in the universe. And he humbled himself so greatly to take on human flesh to die and redeem us. He is fully deserving of God's favor and blessing and honor. Not just by virtue of his deity, but because he is the righteous one. He is the only one who lived a perfect and sinless, obedient life, fully pleasing to the Father in all things. He came to succeed where we failed. He came to please God where we had offended him. He fulfilled all righteousness in his humanity and then he went to the cross where the punishment that we deserve for our sins was laid on him and the wrath of a holy and almighty God against our sin was poured out on him instead of on us. 
When John writes that he is a propitiation for our sins, this is what he's referring to. Propitiation is a very important word that refers to the removal of wrath. God has wrath against sin and sinners. And there can be no fellowship with him unless that wrath is removed and sin is dealt with. We can't bribe God or obey our way into his favor. We cannot do anything to remove that wrath because we've sinned against him. He has wrath against us. And in his justice, it must be satisfied. It's not a capricious thing. It's not random. It's not like someone who loses their temper momentarily only to cool off some time later. God doesn't lose it. God's wrath is not an out-of-control loss of temper. God's wrath is a calculated, perfectly just judgment against sin. And God's wrath must be removed if we are to have fellowship. God cannot be favorable towards a sinful people unless something is done about sin and his wrath towards it. So how is that to be done? By Jesus Christ the righteous, who is our propitiation. He is our wrath remover. How? Because he bore our sins, stood in our place, and God punished him instead of us. He removed our sin so that the obstacle to our fellowship with God is forever taken out of the way and so that God's favor could freely shine upon us. This matters so greatly because God doesn't forgive you based on you telling him you're sorry or because you promise to never do that again. He doesn't forgive you because you repent and think differently about the things that you've done. Repentance is required, but it's not the basis of your forgiveness. God can forgive you because Jesus paid the price for your sins. Now you must repent to experience forgiveness and you must confess your sins to God, but those are not the reasons God forgives sin. Those are necessary responses from us, but Jesus is the reason God forgives sin. Your repentance is not the propitiation for our sin. Your desire to live differently is not the propitiation for sin. That's not what takes God's wrath away. Jesus is the one who takes God's wrath away because he bore it in our place on the cross so that we can have fellowship with God and be the recipients of the favor and blessing of God. Now there's something very important to understand about all this because John doesn't mean to suggest in any way that the Father didn't want to save us, but that Jesus jumped in between us and an angry God to try to make him willing. We know this because John tells us in 1 John 4.10 that in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The Father in love sent the Son, and the Son in love came and voluntarily gave His life for us in love. Jesus didn't jump between us and an unwilling Father who didn't want to save us. This was the will of the triune God. It was the will of the Father. It was the will of the Son and the will of the Holy Spirit. They are one in their will and purpose. So the necessity of the propitiation of Jesus Christ is not because the Father was unwilling to save us until the Son made him willing through his death. The necessity of the propitiation is because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we cannot have fellowship with him while our sin is still in the way, separating us. So the Father in his great love for us sent the Son who came in love for us and willingly took our place at the cross, bearing our sins, removing God's wrath, and bestowing God's favor upon us. So now, how does our advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, the propitiation for our sins, how does he defend us now that we're believers? 
Jesus can stand before the Father and defend us. Even though we as believers have sinned and failed him time without number. Not because we didn't do wrong. But because he did right. Not because we are righteous. But because he is righteous and lived the life God required in our place. Not because we are innocent. But because he, though innocent, bore our sins and died the death we deserved in our place. The Father loves us. The Son loves us. The Holy Spirit loves us. And God has removed everything that separates us from Him so that we can have fellowship with Him. And He has made provision for us today in our remaining sins and corruptions so that we have a defense against all accusation. Now, I don't want you to think that every time a believer sins, that there is a whole court proceeding that must go on in heaven for every sin. God knows that he is willed to save us in sending his son. He hasn't forgotten that. Also, Jesus doesn't need to convince the Father of the merit of what he's done and accomplished for us every time we sin. The Father doesn't need reminded of that either. He's not an unwilling party in our salvation. He's the source of our, of our redemption because salvation is of Him. It's of the Lord who loves us. Now, Stephen Charnock, a preacher and writer from the 17th century, helps explain something here, how Jesus Christ is our advocate with the Father and speaks in our defense. He writes this, that Christ's blood speaks by its merit. Jesus stands as a lamb slain when he presents the prayers of the saints. If the rainbow being looked upon by God reminds him of his covenant not to destroy the world by a flood, how much more are the wounds which Christ bears both in his hands, his feet, and side reminders to him of the covenant of grace made with repenting and believing sinners. You know, every time it rains, the rainbow doesn't have to have a conversation with God about the promise that he made, reminding him not to kill everybody with a flood. Jesus' very presence before God as the lamb slain for our sins, as the God-man in heaven whose hands were pierced and fierce, feet were pierced and side was pierced, who bore the crown of thorns, who would shed his blood and gave his life on the cross for our sins. His very presence defends us because when God accepted his sacrifice, he accepted us in him forever. Christ is our advocate before the Father, not because God always needs convinced to love us, Not because any act of our sin is basically going to convince him otherwise unless Jesus steps in and straightens things out. No. Before the Father is one who eternally has conquered sin and death for all who believe. And his very presence speaks of a finished work, an accomplished salvation, of blood shed for our forgiveness, an infinite value and worth. His righteous life was poured out in death to bring us to God. He has more righteousness in Him than we have sin and corruption in ourselves. And no accusation can stand against us as long as Jesus Christ, our advocate, stands for us. Can't you see how great an encouragement this is that you are to seek to live a life without sinning out of your love for God and His holiness. But that you have one who defends you before God, whose very presence speaks of your salvation and His accomplished redemption for you. Now, there's another important matter we need to spend a few minutes on in this text, and it is the last part of verse 2. It says, He is the propitiation for our sins, 
and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, this is a wonderful truth, but one that we need to be very careful not to misunderstand. This does not mean that everyone's sins are forgiven. This does not teach universalism that everyone will be saved in the end. Neither does it mean that because Jesus died, the wrath of God against sin has been removed from everyone for all their sins. Even John in this letter makes it clear in chapter 5, verse 12, that whoever doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 36, John wrote that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So John is not saying that because Jesus died, everyone is forgiven and all sin is now pardoned. That all wrath is now removed. What this means is that Jesus Christ is the only propitiation for all humanity. He is not the way to be made right with God for Christians, but people who believe other things have other ways. There's no other wrath-removing Savior. There's no other person in the universe who can remove the wrath of God that abides on humanity because of our sin and who can cleanse us from our unrighteousness. There's no other. There's no other hope of salvation other than in Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by Him, period. There are not multiple paths to God. Jesus is not one way among many. All have sinned. All deserve the wrath and condemnation of a holy God. Jesus is the only propitiation, the only wrath-removing Savior for the whole world. And anyone who repents of sin and believes in Him as that wrath removed, as redemption is applied to them because of His sacrifice, and they are welcomed into the favor and the love of the triune God. They're justified. They're adopted into His family. They become indwelt by the Spirit, and He begins a process of sanctifying them a work that he begins that he will carry out to completion. And then they have an advocate in heaven before the Father who and will one day be glorified and freed from sin forever, fully and finally acquitted. Jesus is the only salvation. There is no other salvation. Outside of him, There is no hope for anyone, no matter what a person believes. That's an important thing to realize in a time like ours when people say and believe that all roads lead to God. Now, Jesus might be the way for Christians, but, you know, there are other ways. There's good in all religions. They're all basically the same, you know, be a good person and all that. There are only two ultimate categories of people. dead in sins or alive in Christ. And not everybody who says they know Christ is alive in Christ. But those who walk in the light and follow Him and demonstrate by the way that they live that His grace is at work in their lives. If a person's not alive in Christ, then they are dead in sins and will end up in a real hell unless they repent and believe the gospel of Christ. These things matter so much. This is why the gospel must be preached in all the world. This is why, as Christians, we must share Christ with those around us. Life is fragile. We are here today and we could be gone tomorrow. Eternity lasts forever and Jesus is the only way. God is abundant in mercy and pardon. He's not an unwilling savior. He forgives all who come to Christ in faith because he's a propitiation not just for the sins of believers but for the whole world. Anyone, anywhere who comes to Christ in faith is saved. And in heaven, there will be people there from 
everywhere in the whole world, every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. But not every one. How will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless someone tells them? We're called to share the wonderful grace that we've received in Christ. Without Christ as our advocate, the lost stand justly accused by the law and condemned in their sin. Subject to God's wrath, no amount of good works, no amount of obedience can undo that without Christ as their advocate. Only Jesus Christ, the righteous one, can make sinners right with the holy God. We are called to flee to Christ. We are called to live to please Him. We are called to not take sin lightly, even as believers, especially as believers. We know the God who is light, who is holy, who hates sin, and has made such a great provision for it at such great cost. We must not despair either in our remaining sins and corruptions, but confidently trust in His advocacy for us. We're saved, forgiven, And will one day go to heaven, not because of our righteousness, but because of his. And the evidence of his grace in us is that we desire to please him and that we pursue a life of following him in obedience. Not perfectly, but the pursuit of it shows that we're his. If you've repented of your sins, if you put your trust in Christ for your salvation, and if that reality can be seen in how you live your life, then you can know with great assurance that your sins are forgiven, that you know God, and that there is one whose presence in heaven today, whose very presence pleads for your welcome and acceptance. Because that's what his wounds purchased. He will not lose our case. What an incentive to holiness. Now, our salvation is sure and secure by an infinitely great being who loved us so greatly, we should live in light of that, lives pursuing His holiness, seeking to please Him and not lacking confidence as we fail. Not because we don't take sin seriously, but because we know what has been provided for us. We should love and pursue him all the more because of the great truth in this text. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy that you have not left us in our sins, but you have sent a redeemer to pay the penalty, to pay the price of our redemption so that we could know your forgiveness. Help us to see that sin is exceedingly evil and great. More evil than we could ever imagine or understand in our weakness. That it caused the fall of all humanity into sin, one single sin. That the penalty against it is eternal and great and that the remedy was at the highest cost, the the cost of Christ's life poured out in death on the cross. Father, help us to see that sin is serious but that you have in love made a full payment so that we are freely and fully pardoned from it. And that even as we continue to fail, Lord, Christ's very presence at your right hand pleads in our defense. Not our innocence, but his atoning sacrifice. So God, help us to see that and stand amazed at your love for us, feeling assured in salvation, that you love us greatly, 
that in Christ our sins are truly forgiven now and forever. That you are committed to finishing what you started in us. So help us to, in that great truth of our full and complete salvation, help us to be passionate about holiness and to pursue it earnestly. Father, I also pray that you would convict those that are not in Christ of their sins and grant them faith to believe in him and experience eternal life. Lord, I want to see them be saved and your grace evident in their lives, transforming them into lovers of truth and righteousness, into passionate followers of Christ. Father, work this in us. Make us a grateful gospel people who make much of Christ and are deeply satisfied in him as we pursue to follow him. In Jesus' name, amen.